The greatest achievement for me uh, of Roderick and Charles's papers is their demonstration, um, uh, not just in theory but in practice, um, of the usefulness of uh, spontaneous order explanations. They, uh, I think, show um, how things become clear when you use this uh, mechanism of explanation. But I have two challenge, challenges sorry, uh, for both Roderick and Charles. I'll begin with Charles's discussion of the disagreement between Brown Miller's uh, Br Brown Miller and her critics. I'm not familiar with the literature um, he discusses, but I believe that he might be missing the depth of the disagreement between Brown Miller and her critics, namely on whether there is such a social order as Brown Miller describes in the first place. Not the reality of male dominance, that's a given, but the connection she makes between that and the what, what in the paper he quotes, the discovery that gentelia could serve as weapons. The reason I think there might be such a disagreement is that when I read about Brown Miller's views for the first time, uh, my first reaction was an embarrassed giggle. Um, the world, world Brown Miller describes uh, just seemed to me like a caricature of the world I know. My first challenge concerns that giggle. There is then a distance and misunderstanding between Brown Miller and her critics. Um, there is also a distance between adherence and non-adherence of invisible hand explanations, um, and I think it's instructive to take them together. Take the second distance between adherence and non-adherence of invisible hand explanations. Johnson, uh, um, Charles takes Brown Miller's critics to assume erroneously that the social order she describes has to be the product of some planning. They do so, perhaps as uh, Roderick says, um, because order is one of the cues whereby we recognize the presence of intention. More generally, though, there is here in the background an idea about what it is to explain social orders, the phenomena of social order in principle, and this uh, idea of Brown Miller's critics about social order as something planned is competing with Roderick's and Charles's ideas uh, that social order can be the result of spontaneous developments. So let me briefly overview this competition. Social order is a weird thing. It is a category between, I think, the mechanical and the intentional. Let me explain. When I do something intentional, for example, raise my hand, you can ask me why. But if my hand simply jerks, goes up as a result of some electrical imbalance in my, in my muscles, this sort of why question doesn't apply. It would be like complaining to me that I'm still digesting lunch. It's nonsense. Now, when it comes to social order, we, th we have, I think, conflicting intuitions. Sometimes we think about social orders as mechanical, for it has no uh, mastermind, or no obvious mastermind at least, possibly no, none at all. And sometimes we think about, about it as intentional, for it is more than an anthill. This is the competition, I believe, and I believe that we are genuinely conflicted. We are tempted to amalgamate the two languages. But when we start doing that, things get murky and take talking about, sorry, talking about different degrees of intentionality, for example, or of subconscious mechanisms is often no more than wavering and equivocating. We have to decide which language we want to speak. Otherwise, we just can't make any sense. This is why I think the very idea of invisible hand explanations is so important. It gives us a non-conflicted language. To give invisible hand explanations of social phenomena, then, is both unlike explaining how ma machines work and unlike justifying intentional actions. To explain social phenomena on the invisible hand model is rather to identify patterns of intentions. I'll explain. In large groups, different people have different intentions and ways of thinking and, and act in different ways. But there is no chaos. We can identify patterns among those groups, resemblances, resemblances and differences, strands and currents of thoughts and actions. According to the invisible hand theories, then, these patterns are what we call social order. Now, if this is true, adherents of invisible hand explanations, adherents of that language, are faced with a complicated problem. How to convince people to learn and use this language?
But, and here I criticize Roderick and Charles, it seems that they do not recognize, or not enough at least, the task, uh, that task that they are facing. They seem to think that we can just offer invisible hand explanations as, and that merely upon hearing them, these explanations would instantly make sense to everyone. In his paper, Roderick writes and italicizes, nothing essential is hidden. Um, he, uh, uh, he insists, amazed at how blind people can be. But even if this is true, and I take it to be true, it doesn't mean that people know how to see it, or that they have to see the same thing, the same patterns that Roderick does. There is, I think, reason to be more cautious with one's expectations. A similar argument applies to Charles's paper. There is reason to suspect, that is, not only that Brown Miller's critic dis critics disagree with her, but that in a sense they do not have even understand her. If my first reaction to her claims, my giggle, is any indication, it may be possible that the problem these critics have with Brown Miller's argument is that they do not know how to connect what she says about the reality they take themselves to be familiar with, or so, to connect what she says to the, this reality. It seems very plausible that for them she's offering a caricature, not a theory, that she is describing something perfectly familiar and ordinary in very bizarre and uh, extraordinary way. So imagine a discussion between Brown Miller and a critic. Imagine her saying all those things about genitalia weapons. And imagine the critic listening and being astounded. He wants to laugh, that's his first reaction, but then he looks at her and notices she's not joking. What should he do now? And what should Brown Miller do to help him see what she's after? Possibly the best thing that could be done in such cases is to tempt people, tempt the critic in this case, to somehow see things in a certain light, to identify certain patterns. But tempting people to see uh, things in a different light, uh, um, attempting people, for example, to see things from the perspective of a rape victim is not an easy task. For to begin with, there is nothing tempting about uh, that pain and humiliation. It is much easier to be blind to it. Like in the case of Franz Kafka, another Austrian hunger artist, the tragedy is that uh, what is really a cry of pain can sound to the unfamiliar crowd like a joke. And there may not be any calm, reasoned, organized way of convincing them otherwise. It is not impossible to convince people to start using different language and identify new patterns, but it takes some sort of temptation work. It takes creating the motivation in them to try and see things in a new light. But it doesn't seem that Roderick and Charles are willing to do all the work that's needed. So this is my first challenge to them. How do they expect their arguments to convince their opponents if, in the sense I explain, their opponents do not even speak the language necessary? If they see other patterns, if the patterns that Brown Miller is presenting, for example, strike them as funny. My second challenge uh, is more of a request for clarification. Both Long and Johnson support, in principle, spontaneous order, uh, um, social orders, but they make, make claims that make me worried about such orders in general and anarchy in particular. If Roderick is right, the anarchy seems to have no reason to be an adherent of spontaneous order, for, as he claims, it may lead to uh, the creation of the state, Sp spontaneous order, namely. If uh, Charles is right, the anarchy seems to have no reason to reject the state, for uh, Charles claims the evils we uh, are concerned with, it, concerned with is, are not necessarily the evils of the state. I suggested above that invisible hand explanations supply us with the conceptual scheme we need in the, the social sciences. If this is indeed so, then it should not be altogether surprising that, as Charles and Roderick claim, the male dominant society and the state, which are after all kinds of social orders, will also be, have to be explained in those terms. Any social order has to be explained in, this, in the, those terms. But now, what is anarchy and what is the rape-free society supposed to be beyond the fact that, like any other social order, they are spontaneous orders? The source of my unclarity, I think, is this. Do Roderick and Charles take spontaneous order to be a program for implementation, or do they take it to be a scheme for explanation? 
I suggested it was the latter. Invisible hand explanations give us a language in which to investigate social orders in general, and this is why they are important. The question about the good of social order, discussions in politics in general, cannot even get off the ground without it. For to discuss something, one at least needs to have a language for discussion. If I may take the two pa papers presented today as representative, it seems to me that, uh, it's, that this is not how libertarian anarchists like Roderick and Charles had taken them to be, understand things. They do indeed use the spontaneous order explanation as such a fundamental conceptual scheme, but at the same time, they put it forward as a, an agenda, a suggested platform for social improvement. In other words, they advocate spontaneity within limits, but at the same time take any social reality complicated enough to be spontaneous anyway. So this is my second challenge to, to them. What is the point in fighting for, the, uh, for, what, for what necessarily exists, namely spontaneous order? And what's the point of fighting against what cannot exist, namely non-spontaneous order? Thank you.